All right, welcome to a screencast by A. Parker Blog. My name is Austin Parker, and today we're going to be talking about the annual report to shareholders. So first, let's just jump right in. What is it? What is an annual report to shareholders? We all kind of have a vague idea of what it is. You know, the company telling the shareholders about their activities from the previous year, but let's see what it includes. So it's really a comprehensive report to shareholders about the state of the company. It's going to have a detailed breakdown of the company activities, and those things are going to include an opening letter in the beginning from the company CEO. There's going to be financial data, the results of operations, of course, market segment information, new product plans for products in the future, subsidiary activities in case this company owns other companies, research and development activities on future programs. Now let's take just a second look at what isn't it. Now it's a little bit different than a Form 10-K and the government requires that companies dis disclose this every year. This looks a lot like a bland kind of a tax style form where it's just numbers, nothing fancy. Now, an annual report to shareholders, a lot of people compare it to a marketing material. It is very fancy. It's going to have their brand story and a lot of their marketing lingo. Um, and it's going to have their whole mission statement, what they've done, really to make people feel good about that company. So you can see right here, on the left, that's going to be your Form 10K, right? you got a white piece of paper with black writing nothing fancy and then on the right you can kind of see a little part here from energy trust and this is their annual report to shareholders that's how it starts you have a picture you have all kinds of diagrams nice colored text it looks like a brochure not like a spreadsheet so let's dive right in with the first element and that is the opening letter from the ceo so it's going to serve as an introduction. This is going to head up the rest of the report. It sits at the top. And from the ones that I've seen, they're going to use conversational, relational, and optimistic verbiage. And this is, this is going to make the whole thing seem personal. Personal. So they're going to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. They're going to say, you know, since I've been CEO, this is my struggles. This is what I've seen in our people. We have a great team. And I love the enthusiasm here, the optimism for where we're going, things like that. They're going to make it very personal. It does range in length. I've seen it from just a couple of sentences to a few pages. It can be a video. It can be written. It can be audio recorded. There's a lot of videos on YouTube of CEOs giving this letter on stage. And then you also have it, of course, like we just showed before, where you have a nice fancy website with some pictures. So it varies its personal preference on what the company wants to do. And it's going to include a reflection on the business and industry environment for the reporting year. So for that previous year, they're going to tell you all about the business and how did the industry change? What are the trends in that industry? You're going to see some reflections of company heritage and commitments. So it's not uncommon to hear the roots of the company. Where did they start from? Those humble beginnings that almost every company has. They're going to mention them in here to show you how far they've come. There's going to be a recap of progress made on the company initiatives and programs. So maybe last year they launched a new initiative to sell XYZ product for a certain amount. They're going to give you progress on that. Or maybe they started a charity drive. How many dollars did that raise? Those kind of things they're going to let you know in that opening letter. And then they're also going to reiterate their commitment to future purpose, the growth and profitability of the company. They really want to give shareholders a real but also optimistic look at the company. Nobody's going to want to paint a dismal picture unless they really, really, really have to. So next let's move on to financial data. So this is going to include the highlights of the important financial drivers. It's often placed at the forefront of the report. So right after you hear from the CEO, your financial data is oftentimes next. There's going to be in-depth financial figures after some 
less in-depth figures. So you'll see some kind of big numbers. Where did sales go up? Where did market share go up? And then you'll see a more granular breakdown of that below it. There's going to be a historic record of trends from the company's past financial performance. And then it's also going to include, like I said, market share percentage year over year. Sometimes they'll date that back two years, five years, ten years, whatever they're trying to show. Next, let's go to results of operations. Now, results of operations, it's going to be the detailed results from the previous year. And it's also going to include financial performance, market, and industry information. So you're going to see a lot of comparisons here between different rivals in the industry and how they size up. It's going to explain the uses of the performance metrics to compare results of operations to past company performance. So you're going to see different metrics involved from different companies because it varies from industry to industry which ones are relevant. And it can include information about growth. You're going to see this broken down and highlighted into different divisions. So maybe a company has an online division and a brick and mortar division, what was the growth rate for each one because those are going to vary, especially today in the age of the internet. It's going to be how they leverage expenses, different capital expenditures, so are they in a growth mode right now? Are they trying to close up stores? Maybe they sold um, a subsidiary company of theirs or maybe they liquidated some assets that were large and that's going to show up here. And then also, of course, your return on investment. So what was their return on investment of the money they sunk into their company? All right, next we're going to go on to market segment information. So this is going to outline the status of various market segments, the success and failure over the year and into the past. So which ones have we been successful at? Which ones should we maybe not be in at all? And then it's going to detail the current products or services sold in the region, and it's going to give the why. Why are we not selling a certain project, product in Europe, and we're selling it in America? And then it's going to state the strategies for growth in different market segments, including planned product or service rollouts. And then also it's going to touch on the geopolitical climate of each segment, we know this can be a hot topic and it can surely affect things in the business world. And so they're going to have a little write up on this and saying how they think they can do business, how it's going to hurt them, or how it's going to help them. And again, they're going to speak to the current or the predicted trends and tastes. We know those are changing. And so they're going to try to get a jump start on that and see where where is the trend going to. And they're going to say this in different market segments, break it down. Next, we have new product plans. So you can see again right here on this picture, this is a pretty fancy product. <clears throat> They're going to say, how are we transforming our portfolio, right? Maybe we're getting rid of gluten in all of our products. Maybe we're getting rid of high fructose corn syrup. Or maybe we're a trendsetter in a digital company, you know. Our products are better than other people's in this, in this certain way. Or they will be. It's going to outline the status of the new products. And they're going to be open about the challenges and setbacks. So maybe they've had a harder than anticipated time of taking out the high fructose corn syrup. Maybe they faced some backlash from the public over doing so. That's going to be outlined here. There's going to be long-term long and short-term plans. And then tentative release windows as well, possibly. And they're going to give the reasons for resources needed for product and service launches. So maybe they need to build a new factory to build all those gluten-free drinks or whatever you have. And they're going to align that, align that in this report. And then they're going to address how new products will fit the demands of the customer. So this kind of ties in back to that last slide about the different changes and trends that go on. And they're going to address, you know, well, if no one wants gluten-free cereal, then we shouldn't make it, but obviously people do, so that's why they're going to make it, and they're going to state that here. Next, there's subsidiary activities. So some big companies own other companies, subsidiaries, and they're going to give updates on these companies. So in this slide right here to the right, you can see this is Tesla Motors, now known as Tesla, and they bought SolarCity, 
and so that's one of their subsidiary companies and this is one of their new solar roofs that they've got coming out so they're going to give updates on that and then how these activities impact the main company so does it relate back to the main company and how again here's my example Tesla they required they acquired solar city and they're now producing this new solar roof and that slide is actually from their annual report to shareholders they did a big show about it and yep and made it into the presentation and so now moving on we got research and development activities on future programs you can see how much we're spending on those programs there's going to be information about the resources allocated to them it may include partnerships with other com companies <clears throat> especially the technology companies that could help produce future products. So maybe Apple needs to make a new phone and they buy all of their chips from say AMD. Um, that could be in this slide. It's often used to give reassurance to investors of a brighter future with prototypes and more. How many times have you seen a prototype of a car from a car company that is really wild and it's awesome, it's great, it's wonderful. You never see it really come out to fruition. Well, that's kind of, you know, giving people hope, but never quite delivering. I know it's annoying, but companies do it. So in conclusion, I'd like to give you a couple of quotes here. The first quote from Business Encyclopedia tells this about the annual report to shareholders. They say, in view of contemporary report writing styles and the ways that reports for shareholders are written and produced, it is often said that annual reports are essentially marketing communications. Again, that goes back. You're marketing to your shareholders because you want them to hold on to your shares. You don't want everybody to sell. There goes the value of your company. And here's another one from Investopedia. An annual publication that public corporations must provide to shareholders to describe their operations and financial conditions. The front part of the report often contains an impressive combination of graphics photos, and an accompanying narrative, all of which chronicle the company's activities over the past year. The back part of the report contains detailed financial and operational information. So you can see this lines up to what we've been talking about. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you listening. And if you have any questions or comments or anything, just go ahead and leave those below. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.